since 2002, Eclipse stands for Chinese Life Science post elegant students at Stanford. Um, you know, our organization members are mostly made up of uh, life science students, scholars, and professionals, mostly from Stanford, but also in, from, uh, from other schools in the Bay Area. Um, the, our main events or activities, you know, we have sort of like a three-pronged approach uh, to help facilitate career development, uh, scientific interaction, and social networking, and finally to help you uh, help everybody improve your life on and off campus. You can find our website here, or just Google Clips, and the first one you will find it. Uh, we're always looking for talents to join us. So right now, we stand at about 17 people on the board. We start with around four or five people, so we've grown exponentially. Uh, obviously, there are a few perks for joining us. Uh, you, you get to meet a lot of new people, hone your leadership and communication skills, and also uh, catch up on the latest news on current opportunities. So whenever we hear about new jobs, if you're on the board, you hear about it first. <laughs> so if you want a job, come join us. Okay. So some of the past events, just very quickly uh, going through these, uh, you know, we recently we had a Lake Pharma uh, site visit. Uh, Lake Pharma is a uh, biotech company here in the Bay Area. We also, a while ago, we had a fellowship seminar. Uh, we, we have, you know, a list of activities going on, usually on average two to three per month. Uh, a lot of these are, uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline uh, being planned right now. Uh, this, this list is by no means exhaustive, so definitely check our website. We update our website and we send out a lot of updated uh, emails and the newsletters constantly. Uh, I just want to, you know, obviously announce these sponsors. You know, a lot of these activities wouldn't be possible without these sponsors, right? They provide, they provide us the financial means to do these things. <clears throat> All right, so Dr. Charles Lee. Um, Dr. Charles Lee is currently a professor of management at the Graduate School of uh, Business here at Stanford. Before uh, his arrival at Stanford, he held numerous faculty positions at programs such as uh, Ross at Michigan, Johnson at Cornell, Wonghua at Peking University, and finally here at Stanford. You know, all of these programs belong to the most elite business programs in the world. So that speaks to Dr. Charles Lee's, you know, his his role in this in the education uh, in the business education. <clears throat> but his accomplishment doesn't just end right there. Dr. Lee has also held numerous influential roles in asset management, ranging from managing director at Barclays Global Investors. Chief Advisor at Posera Funds, and also uh, currently General Partner at Put Capital, where he uh, advised on and managed hundreds of dollars, million dollars worth of assets. In addition to everything I've mentioned, obviously Dr. Lee has also has had many other prominent roles uh, in his career, well, but for sake of time, I won't touch on them today. So a renowned educator, a successful business manager, and a respected figure here at Stanford. Today, we're honored and humbled to have Dr. Lee to share his life experience and wisdom with us. Please join me in giving a warmest welcome to Dr. Lee. Thanks very much. Thank you for uh, welcoming me over, me over here. I don't get to this side of campus very often. Those of you, how many of you go to the business school pretty often? <laughs> That's what I thought, too. Yeah, so. Um, I noticed that the certain laws of, uh, of physics actually apply on both sides of campus. For example, when I teach MBAs, they also don't sit in the first two rows. So <laughs> it seems like some things are consistent on either side of campus. Um, uh, but I'm just delighted to be here. I'm thrilled uh, to have the opportunity to share some things with you. Um, <laughs> I was born in Taiwan, I'm MIT, made in Taiwan. And my father is Hangzhou Ren, my mother is Shandong Ren, but I'm MIT. Um, and I came over to the U.S. when I was, well, to Canada when I was nine years old. So, so so I have fully advertised my nine-year-old Mandarin, so I thank you for allowing me to use English. Uh, but later on, during the question and answer, if you have any questions and if you'd like to say it in, English, in Chinese, it's okay with me. I think it's okay. So, right. Uh, okay. So, um, this topic uh, called You Are Not Your Resume uh, is one that's, that's been on my mind for a while. Um, and actually, the title itself, its subtitle is Personal Reflections on Success, Significance, and the Pursuit of Happiness. Uh, and, uh, 
it, the title actually came from an article that I read at Stanford, in Stanford Daily, uh, back in 2010 by a young man by the name of Nicola. Now, I don't know who Nicola is, but I enjoyed his article. Um, and the title was called You Are Not Your Resume. And Nicola was an undergraduate. And uh, he, in his article, what do you mean when they went to home? All right, too bad. But uh, anyway, I'll have to stick with it. So uh, he said, we may be captains and presidents, attractive and accomplished. That's him talking, right? So, but that only makes us good at those things. It does not necessarily make us good at being people. I you guys should do You know, being smart, being at Stanford doesn't make you good. And then he told us, he told us, he reflected on the article that he read in his uh, class, philosophy class, uh, called The Disparity Between Intellect and Character. And that article was by a Harvard psychiatrist professor, psychiatrist professor, and it's called Moral Reasoning is Not to be Equated with Moral Conduct. In that article, just very quickly, uh, the professor says one day a young lady came, this is a Harvard, and this young lady uh, is from the Midwest. She's from a poorer family. And so she had to work her way through school while she's going to Harvard. And one of the things she does is clean, clean um, in the dormitory rooms. And uh, there was another boy who uh, goes to the same class, uh, ethics class, with her. And the boy gets straight A's. Uh, you know, she's like a C student. Okay. And, uh, but the boy um, was very rude to her when she was cleaning his room. In fact, he, was, he made overtures. I mean, he was like propositions. Anyway, ta, ta, so he, he was very, you know, he co coerced her. And she was very um, troubled. And she went to the professor and she said, you know, if we write an essay on how to live, how to conduct ourselves, uh, he would get an A, A plus. And I would get probably a C. But why is it that people who know so much about what to do does not live like they do? And this thing troubled the professor. So the professor wrote this article. And his main observation is that there is a gap between our moral ability to reason and our ability to live a life that we want to live. And so this young man was reflecting on this. He says, well, I thought, well, this is great. These Stanford undergrads are thinking about important things in life, right? So, so then, um, then he goes on and he says in this article, he says, what does it mean to have a valuable character? He's reflecting on what it means. And then he says, what does this ephemeral, amorphous, hard to define notion of being good really mean? So we don't know how. We good. I have no idea. He said, my back, uh oh. I cannot tell you what he will say. I hope nobody was reading this waiting for the answer. He said, at the end of the day, going to Stanford does not necessarily mean that we are good people, just smart people. Then he says, maybe, in all honesty, being a good person is overrated. Oh, boy. It sure doesn't guarantee you a job or land you an attractive spouse. But whatever it is, it cannot be equated to your resume. Maybe we should strive to teach ourselves that. I all. It was very depressing to me when I got to that point. Because I was waiting for him to tell me what it is that he is other than his resume. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, but I, the resume pays me. The resume gets me a good looking wife. I don't know about the rest. I started to ask myself, is this, a, is this an institutional failure? Is this, is this the case that most of the time the university has stopped talking about these things? Is that why the, we have this problem? And certainly many others, as I did research, felt the same way. Uh, Dennis O'Brien is a professor who talked about the disappointing moral curriculum. Anthony Corman, another academic, said, we, I have watched the question of life's meaning lose its status as a subject of organized academic instruction, pushed to the margins of professional respectability, where it once occupied a central and honored place. What he's saying is universities used to be about teaching people how to be people, how to have character. But now we have regressed. We have gone to the point where we are very, very specific. We are technical. We are siloed. We teach how to in every little unit. And we don't visit each other, and we don't discuss why we live. He concludes that this is unfortunate. He said it's cushy, the shirt. And in fact, in, in, in the, the, the survey suggests that does not mean the students have stopped asking. It's just the, the professors have stopped talking. The students in, in the UCLA survey says very few percentage of the students that were surveyed indicated satisfaction with how their college experience 
but offered opportunities for religious and spiritual development. 62% said their professors never encouraged discussion of spiritual or religious issues. I can understand why. Because a lot of people feel that if we start talking about these things, we're going to disagree, we're going to argue, it's going to be controversial. So the way to avoid that is to not talk about it. We privatize our faith. Now, I understand this, right? if, yeah. but at the same time, if we are teaching the leaders of tomorrow, this is where we are supposed to educate them. Are we not supposed to model for them a society, a human society that works? where we can disagree without being disagreeable? Are we not supposed to talk about how we resolve these things and reflect on these things and whether they are scientific or not? Shouldn't we be talking about it? University used to be universal and diversity. We used to discuss the things that matter and recognize that we live in diversity. And I feel it's really unfortunate. The reason why I'm here today is because I am quite distressed. And when I was asked to do this, I said, well, I'm an accountant on the other side of campus. Why am I here talking to a bunch of life scientists? You know, they're really bright, and mm -hmm. I, I balance books. But I feel there's a great need. There's a great need for all of us across the university to think about what life is about and how to live well. We all want to live well. We all want to be happy. But what does it mean to live well and to be happy? These are the things I want to talk to you about. And this is particularly urgent because as I look across this landscape, especially among Asian Chinese, I am worried. You have heard about all the suicides in Palo Alto High, right? Eight of them in the last 12 months. Five out of them are Asians. Why? Why are our high school kids killing themselves by walking onto, onto, the, onto the railroad tracks? It's not just the, the Palo Alto kids. If you read this article, it rips your heart out. This young lady is, um, is a representative at, at the Poly High. And then she's thinking about how she talked about how, you know, at a very young age, they were separated into the fast track and the slow track. He said, nobody calls that one the dumb track. But, it, but if you're not in the fast track, you know who you are. <laughs> and then it continues. This was way back in elementary school. She talks about the incredible pressure of performance, performance, performance. And we don't just see this in Palo Alto High School, we see this in all the major universities around the country, and not only in the United States, also in China. Uh, William, this, this man whose name is like, hard to pronounce, he's a former Yale professor, he wrote a book recently called Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of the American Elite and the Way to a Meaningful Life. He, he describes the excellent sheep, he said, these are people, he said, that go to the top universities, you know, he names heights. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're heisters. So he says, that, you know, many are excellent sheep. He said, they're excellent because they're very good at jumping hoops. You put a higher hoop, they jump it. You put a higher hoop, they jump it. That's why they're here. But they are sheep because their excellence is very narrow. They're very focused. They become very good at jumping things. But they've not taken the time to think, to think about what life is all about. And he says, and because of this narrowness, their, their excellence and their life is, is characterized by two things. One is a sense of self-grandeur, a sense that, you know, I'm really somebody. Why else would I not? Why else would I be here? I'm a somebody. He said, but the other one is emotional fragility. That is, they are fragile. That is, all of a sudden, if they're not number one, life can collapse on them. And therefore, we get these, these, this funny little dynamic going on. And he says, basically, you know, this is a problem. Now, I'm not sure I agree with all of his solutions, but I agree with the problem. I think it's very pervasive. And so what I want to do is spend a little time talking with you about what is success, what is significance, what can we do that might help live a more meaningful life. And I don't have all the answers, that's for sure, but I can tell you a little bit about the mistakes I've made and some of the guiding principles I picked up along the way. Let me start by asking you, what does success look like? If I asked you to draw a picture of success, what would you draw? What would, what would come to your mind? This is actually a question I asked a bunch of young people when I was teaching them in high school. In, these are high school kids in my church. So I was teaching them. I asked them, draw me a picture of success. And I'll tell you exactly, this is exactly a true story. What happened? These are the boys. The boys started drawing. 
I didn't draw it right, but this is the way you do it. You draw this guy with muscles. You know, to be successful, you have to be fit. Okay, you have to like have six packs. You know, six pieces down there. So uh, it's uh, not a good drawing, but they drew it. And then you know, they drew the guy with a with a with a suitcase and cash falling out. Because there's no point being successful if you I mean, if you're going to be poor, a poor athlete. Or, you know, if you have that money, you got to be fit. And then they kept going. They put a tennis racket in their hand because at the time, you know, they're I'm a, you know they are, uh, you know, this is a Chinese church. And uh, at the time, uh, what's his name? Um, Michael Chen, uh, Michael Chen. He he was 16 years old. He's Chinese. He won the French Open. So to them, this was success. And he said, I'm a Christian. Right? So that made him feel, made them feel really good. So, and then they drew a, a, a car. Actually, he, they, they couldn't find a good one, but this is, they drew a, a Benz, Mercedes Benz. And they put a boat behind it because you had to use your time. And they were really going, so they painted an airplane. So they were really going. And then, because they are Christian, they drew a church. The guy, you know, to be successful, you've got to have a certain amount of, you know, spirituality, you know. So they draw the church on the side. And then you had, you know, you have that wife and two kids. If they can draw two and a half, they would draw two and a half. Right? So this was their picture of success. And I thought, oh, hmm, interesting. Then I turned around to the girls. I said, girls, what did you draw? So they showed me what they drew. They actually sketched this out. They drew two people. They drew one, a woman at the podium. Her hands were raised, and she was, all these microphones in her mouth. There's Margaret Thatcher. The girls would drew Margaret Thatcher. I said, well, that's very good. Now, she was the Prime Minister of England, and obviously a successful lady. And then they drew a woman, a nun, sitting by a poor person. This was Mother Teresa. To them, that was a picture of success. She, uh, she cared for the poor. She, you know, I can tell you that girls are just a little, you know, just a little more with it, right? Look at this. Okay, so, so I said, well, this is very interesting. Very interesting. I said, okay, okay, now let's do an exercise. Start erasing. What can you remove from this picture and still have a successful person? So the boys start thinking, and they said, well, maybe the airplane can go. <laughs> then they thought about it, and they said, well, okay, the boat. Maybe, maybe the car. You know, they started to juggle. So I turned around to the girls, and I said, girls, what about you? If Margaret Thatcher didn't have all those microphones, if she wasn't famous, would she still be successful? And then I turned around, and I said, what about um, Mother Teresa? If she never won a Nobel Prize, would she still be a successful person? And I said, you know, we come to this awareness that maybe real success doesn't need the kind of external validations that we tend to associate with it. Let me ask you a more basic question just for you guys. This is too, too big to cold call, so let me just start and then say, uh, is success a good thing? Now, how many of you don't want to be successful? Just raise your hand so we can count. <laughs> Nobody wants to be unsuccessful, right? Success seems like a good thing. What about being a successful liar? What about being a successful thief? What about being a successful terrorist? If success is contextual, right? Success is not necessarily tangible, and success is, not, is contextual. What does success mean? It simply means I've attained a goal. I'm successful because I achieved my goal. That's what success is. It's always relative to a goal. The success of a knife is to cut because it was made to cut. The success of a racehorse is to run because it was designed to run, it was bred to run. What about a human being? What makes a human being successful? That depends on what you think a human being is. You understand? No matter where you begin, no matter where you are from and what religious affiliation you are, the last and important questions in your life are going to get to that point. You're going to ask, what is a human being and why am I here? It's the questions that the security guard asks you at night when you are working late, right? <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing here? Where did you come from? And where are you going? It's the same questions we ask ourselves when we were three, four, five. And those questions actually never leave. And to tell you the truth, even if you don't have an answer, 
you implicitly have answered it. You have made a decision in your life about those questions. Otherwise, you could not live day to day. You have decided either, I don't know, and I don't care. I'm going to do the best I can. Or you've decided, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> or you've decided, I don't know, and I only want to talk about it with my favorite people. Whatever you've decided, that influences how you look at the world. Because we all have, we all have a commitment to a certain metaphysical view of the world, of reality. And that metaphysical commitment affects everything you do. If you think that there was nothing after death and this is it, we're just going to maximize my 80, well, you know, I have a moral, I have a hazard function and I figure out how, roughly how long I'm going to live, I'm going to maximize this period, that's an assumption. If you think there's more, that's an assumption too. How am I doing? Oh, I got very lots to do. Okay, so I got plenty to talk to you about, so I really want to leave 15 minutes at the end to, to, to answer questions. So let me very quickly talk to you a little bit. You know, there's a very good comparative religion course at Yale, taught by a professor of, of uh, uh, theology, actually, called Marislav Volk. He says, you know, what are the proper ends towards which we should orient our lives? And then he takes different worldviews. Buddhism, Hinduism, Atheism, Judaism, Christianity, and say, whatever worldview you are, say you're, say you're an atheist, let's say you're an agnostic, whatever worldview you are. Ask these five questions of your worldview. Number one, according to this worldview, what does it mean to live your life well? What does it mean to live well? Number two, what reasons are given for doing it? So what's the evidence? What's the, what's the reason for this? Number three, what kinds of help do they offer? In other words, this worldview. Okay, what resources are available for you to live well? Number four, what happens if you fail? Suppose you want to aspire to this and it doesn't work. What resources are there? What recourses are there? And number five, and this is a very important one, to whom are you responsible? I think this is a very telling question. This is the difference between a philosophy class and a class <laughs> about living. We are all accountable to somebody. To whom are you responsible? I think this is a great set of questions, and actually I think it would be great to go through this and go through each of the world religions and each of the, the world views and ask these questions. I want to spend just a little bit of time talking to you about my own world view. Um, you know, I, I'm a Christian. Um, I actually was not born that way. I grew up in a family in which um, my parents didn't believe Christianity. At, at the age of 24, I had an experience which led me to become a Christian. And if I had more time, I'd tell you more about that experience. Um, but it had a profound influence on me. I was 24. Let me just very quickly say. So I, I, um, I was 24. If you looked at my outside of my life, you would say, this guy is doing really well. You know, he's rolling along. He's, he's done well in school. He's, he's working in an accounting firm. He, but in my life, inside, it's pretty messed up. It was really messy. I don't even know where I would be. I don't even know if I'd still be alive a few years after that. But I had this uh, an amazing experience which led me to, to, be, to become convinced that actually uh, God does exist and that there is a, a, a purpose in my life and <laughs> that it has, a it has had a dramatic influence in the way I look at life, the way I look at people, the reason I chose to be a professor and why I'm here today. So, whatever you believe about God, here's one, you know, one person whose life really did turn around. And you may not like me. Some people say, you know, some Christians don't do that. You know, like, actually, I don't know lots of non-Christians who are nicer people. I won't argue with you. But we're not talking about a cross-sectional comparison here. Let's, if you looked in time series, okay, if you, I can, one thing I know for sure, you would like me less if I were not a Christian today. And so I don't, um, this, this coming to faith in 1982 had a dramatic influence on my career choices. What I chose to do, what I did, discovered that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I, what, I, what I did, the decisions I made about which school to go, which schools to turn down. I actually, 
all the way through my career, why I left investment business when things were going extremely well and I was managing a lot of money, why I decided to come back to, to academia, and why I'm here today. So um, if I have an opportunity, I'll, I'll answer more questions about that. But I wanted to get down to the last piece, because I'm saving 15 minutes to talk about this. So, So I've uh, graduated out of grad school in 1990, so it's been 25 years. Um, before I went into grad school, I already had five years of work experience. So in this 30 years, right, I found that there are a number of guiding principles that were very helpful to me. I find them helpful whether I'm Christian or not. I just think they're very helpful. And I want to share with you these three things. These things came out because the, the Asian, Asian American Association at the business school asked me to go give a little talk. Um, I only had 15 minutes, so I talked about these three things. So today I want to share with you those three things. This is a little talk about leadership, a little talk about values. So these are the three principles I would just share with you. They all come out of my worldview, but you can think about whether they fit into your worldview as well. The first principle is that human beings have intrinsic value. Human beings have intrinsic value. Now, a lot of people think that that's common sense, right? Uh, but maybe not, right? Maybe not. Uh, when I travel through Asia, sometimes I'm not sure that people are very clear about that. When I look at how people treat themselves, the decisions that some people make, sometimes I'm not sure that they know that either. So what do I mean by intrinsic value? Intrinsic value is not functional value. Functional value is what a thing or a person is worth in use. A fan has functional value in the summertime, less so in the winter. And human beings have functional value to other human beings. Now, people know how to be good to people who have functional value to them. People are less sure about that when it comes to people who have no functional value to them. Intrinsic, human beings have intrinsic value. Intrinsic value means just value, just because they are human beings. It's not functional value, and it's not commercial value. Commercial value is how much you can get for something in a marketplace. It's kind of, in the case of a human being, maybe the worth of a resume. But human beings have value beyond their resume. They're just intrinsically valuable. I, um, when I first started working, I was working in an accounting firm. It was national research. Um, I, met, uh, I made a friend with, with a, a secretary who was the executive assistant to one of the major partners. One day she said to me, do you notice that your partner, who's also a very senior person, um, you know, she, it was a she, um, when she comes into a room, she, she never talks to the secretaries. She never actually seems to talk to anybody except the partners. I said, really? No, that can't be right. And then I paid attention, and that was in fact the case. That moment I said to myself, for the rest of my career, I am going to pay attention to the secretary or at least to the people who are not necessarily functionally useful to me. Human beings have intrinsic, innate value. And if you, if you treat them that way, you will be amazed at how different life is. When I'm a professor, um, and I, I, th I teach these young professors who just graduated, actually I've been asked for the eighth time to talk at the American Accounting Association's new faculty consortium to teach people how to teach. And one of the things I tell them is, look, nobody knows how much you care. I mean, nobody knows how much you know until they know how much you care. And nobody knows how much, nobody cares how much you know until they know, you know, they know how much you care. The professors that made a difference in your life are people who, who treated you as if you had value, not necessarily because you're the A student, but because you're just a human. So human beings have, have intrinsic value. 
Um, it's consistent with my faith because my faith tells me that. It says that God actually came in the person of a, in, 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 and that we are made in the image of God. And, and so it isn't how much, how well we perform that gives us value. It's just that we are human beings. Not every worldview may derive that, but I think it's consistent with mine. Human beings have a trick of value, and it's helped me in my life. To me, that's an immediate in implication of the incarnation. That is, if God becomes man, then man has value. So, okay, so that's one. So let me, yeah. Yeah, it's not just other people have value, you have value. You know, there, there are good days and there are bad days that work, right? Um, what's a good day? A good day is when I win a teaching award or I publish some major paper. What's a bad day? A bad day is when somebody just cuts me off in traffic or, or somebody does, you know, or, or my company loses money or something like this, right? But for me, having my faith helps me to look at the all world and say, you know, I have been loved by the most lovable being ever. And if I don't get tenure at Stanford, that doesn't change. If I don't, if my students give me a lousy evaluation, human beings have intrinsic value. You have intrinsic value. I want to live like I believe that. And I want you to hold me accountable when you see that I don't live that human beings have the intrinsic value. That's number one. Number two. Okay. The pursuit of happiness cannot be separated from the pursuit of virtue. The pursuit of happiness cannot be separated from the pursuit of virtue. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody says, uh, you know, what's, what's a picture of success? One of my students drew a happy face. Okay. To them, that's success. But what does it mean to be happy? And why is happiness so elusive in life? If you want, I wish I could tell Nichols, if you want to know how to be happy, you need to wrestle with the more difficult question of what it means to be good, to be virtuous, to do the right thing. Because if you try to pursue happiness apart from pursuing virtue, you will find yourself in a little corner in which you have neither. A very selfish little corner. In fact, some of my colleagues who have done research in, on happiness, uh, one of them is Jennifer Acker. She, she, uh, she's a sociologist, who special, psychologist who specializes in happiness. What they found in their experiments over and over again is that the people who are happiest are not the people who are trying to be happy. They're people who actually have a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. That is, when they pursue something worth pursuing, they find themselves happy. And that happiness is much more of a wellness, a certain healthiness within them, than a certain sort of temporal feeling that comes because of external circumstances. The happiness that we get from external circumstances are dependent upon circumstances. But there is something deeper that comes from living a life of meaning, a life of purpose, and that requires you to think hard about what it means to live with meaning and with purpose. And if you are not the religious type, you should at least ask yourself, what does it mean to be good? What does it require of me? Those are the questions that I think worth asking, worthy of where you are. Okay, now, this book, Success Built to Last, was written by three, uh, three people. This was, and when I first came to the business school seven years ago, I was given a copy of this book by the by the dean. Um, because uh, Jerry Porras, Emmer, Emery, they are both uh, alums of the business school. This book is called Success Built to Last, Creating a Life That Matters. It's an unusual, more than any other book, it's probably the DNA of the Stanford Business School. And uh, what does it do? It's not a regular book where you basically read chapter by chapter, chapter after chapter. It actually consists of 200 interviews with 200 people whom the authors felt have made a lasting difference. By that meaning, a life that actually made other lives better. Now, who are these people? So these are interviews. And these people include 
the names that you would know. Uh, so lasting meaning at least 20 years. Okay. Nelson Mandela. Everybody know Nelson Mandela, right? South, South African activist uh, lawyer who uh, worked hard to eliminate apartheid in South Africa. Jimmy Carter, I think most of you know him, former U.S. President uh, and Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner. Helen Keller, okay, most of you know her. She's uh, blind and she's deaf. She's brilliant, uh, a writer, a poet. Paul Hewson, those of you guys know Paul. How many know Paul Hewson? It's harder. He's known by a different name. He, he, any, have you heard of the music band Bono? Bono? No? Well, you guys have to get to the other side of campus. <laughs> so Bono is actually one of the major rock bands, right? So Bono, uh, his, their lead singer is Paul Hewson. Paul Hewson is obviously very wealthy, but he also has done an enormous amount for, uh, for Africa and, and for uh, uh, alleviating poverty in Africa. Uh, Muhammad Yunus, have you heard of him? These guys probably got all won Nobel Prizes. A couple of these didn't win Nobel Prizes, but most of them won Nobel Prizes. Mohammed Yunus started microfinancing in Bangladesh. You know, how small amounts of money lent to small businesses helped them to self be self-sufficient. That's okay. Many other so-called unknowns. When they studied all these people, the one thing they found that they had in common was that they were, see, so in this book, right, that was talking about success, they said, although success, this is the quote from the, from the introduction, although success can easily be defined as the achievement of goals, there's a difference between temporary and lasting success. I don't think you achieve success unless you add another ingredient to the mixture, and that is to serve a cause greater than yourself. That is what lasting success is all about. What they observed is that the, he says the current definition of success is potentially toxic prescription for your life and work. If you think success in terms of wealth, fame, and power, it doesn't last and it's not satisfying. In fact, he says instead, what they found that all these 200 people had in common was that lasting success never comes without a compelling personal commitment to something you care about and would be willing to do with or without counting on fame wealth, power, or public acceptance as an outcome. It, in other words, you have to be able to let go of those tangible measures of success in order to live something that is potentially meaningful. It does not mean that you always let go. It simply means that your priorities are very clear. The way I think about this is you can't own something if, if you can't let it go. Whatever that is, if that's something, whatever it is in your life, if you cannot let it go, it means that it owns you. You don't own it. If you can't let it go, it's not yours. You are it. But this is what they call the Mandela effect. You know, Nelson Mandela was, uh, was jailed for what he believed in, right? And uh, um, he was jailed in 1964 at the age of 44. And he was pressed to compromise his beliefs for, in exchange for early freedom. Right? He continued to refuse. He was released finally in 1990. That's after 27 years. Right? He was at the age of 71. And rightly, he should have been the most dangerous man in Africa. When he came out, you would think he would want revenge. But instead of looking for revenge, he went for peaceful reconciliation. And he helped to transition the way to an independent democracy in South Africa. He did this because he believed in something. It was more important than him. And in fact, he says, when you can create enduring success, not, the Mandela effect is when you can create enduring success, not because you are perfect or lucky, but because you have the courage to do what matters to you. So, let me repeat. Number one, human beings have intrinsic value. These are just guiding principles. What's number two? The pursuit of happiness cannot be separated from the pursuit of virtue. Those two things helped me a lot in my career. Here's the third one. The third one's very related to the other two. Invest in the success of those around you. Invest in the success of those around you. If human beings have intrinsic value and the pursuit of happiness cannot be separated from the pursuit of virtue, it makes sense to invest in the success of those around you. 
but it's not an easy thing to do. Why? Well, if he looks good, I might look bad. If I invest in him, what happens to me? It takes a little bit of faith. It takes a little bit of belief to say that the way to do this is to invest in others. But this has been my experience, you know. If some people would call green thumbs. Why are they green thumbs? Because everything, they know how to grow plants. Everything around them is green. So we say this person has a green thumb. If every person around you is green, you're going to be okay. You really are going to be okay. This, the business school over there has a pretty good reputation at Stanford. The PhD program is probably the most difficult one to get into. This is true in accounting, and finance, a number of other fields that I'm close to. Last year we made five offers. We got five people. They turned down all the other schools in the country. There are a lot of great ones. And I was bragging to my finance colleague, and my finance colleague said, we got 848. Eight. We're not saying that there's... The reason why this school is really, really extraordinary is because people have invested. These professors are reckless. They just invest. They don't count. If you look at your life and you say, what, who has made a difference in my life? You think about the professors that made a difference. These are people who basically just invested in you. When I was at this, uh, the, 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 at this company, BGI, I came in there. I was a professor. I had no experience in asset management. I had one person reporting to me. Right? And in six months, I was running U.S. And in one and a half years, I was running global. How does a professor who doesn't have anything going on other than like writing papers end up managing 300 some billion dollars? I had a very simple rule. I just said, you know, I'm going to invest the people around me. I'm going to promote the people who are great. I'm going to try to hand off my job as soon as I can. I eventually handed off my job. But I felt good about it. And I really think that if you actually take this heuristic seriously in your life, you're going to do okay and you're going to enjoy it too. All right, so these are the three things, right? Human beings have intrinsic value. Pursuit of happiness cannot be separated from pursuit of virtue and invest the success of those around you. All three of these are related to my faith, but they are independent to some extent of my faith. Many worldviews may arrive at the same principles. Let me end, because I really would like to have some time to chat with you. A little while ago, I saw a picture, a photograph that I liked a lot. It was actually in a bookstore. This is the photograph. The guy in the rain looks like it's Paris. He's holding an umbrella, but he wasn't holding it over himself. He was holding it over his cello. And I remember looking at that picture, and I remember thinking, that is a blessed man, you know? The guy knows how to live. Why? Because here is a guy who has found something in life more important than himself. Something he believes in, something he wakes up every morning wanting to do. And it's a blessing. Yeah, I feel very blessed. My career as a professor, as an academic, as a business person, I feel very blessed because there is something more worthwhile. So let me end. I'm going to use some Chinese, sneak some in. In the Bible, there is this verse that I like a lot in a very old book called Jeremiah. And this, in that book, in Chinese and in English, this is God talking. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll leave that with you and uh, save a little time for questions. Okay. About 15 minutes. I have a question. I'm wondering, uh, what were the most difficult times in your life, and how did you, you know, use these principles to yeah, get it through? 
Okay, great question. What was the most difficult time in my life, and how do I use this principle? Um, so I didn't expect this question, but let me think about three three times when it was very difficult. Once before I was a Christian, once after I was a Christian, and then once last week. <laughs> so it's my wife, and she knows all these instances. Before I was a Christian, how did I become a Christian? One of the one of the I I grew up. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure whether God existed. And God and I came to a truce after I got to college because I figured, well, if he exists, he never introduced himself to me, then I don't have any obligations to him. And I'm going to do my best and, you know, and uh, if, if this God wants me to worship him, if he doesn't worship, if I don't worship him, then, then he's going to send me to some unpleasant place. Then he's not worth worshiping to start with. Okay, I'm going to do my best. So... And never, but when I got to college, a couple of things happened that really sort of hit me. One was my dad got cancer. Um, and that, that was very, uh, a big shock to me. He was pretty young. He died in his early 50s. The other is that I had a number of uh, failed romances. That's about the nicest one. <laughs> so a lot of relationships that didn't work out. And when I thought back on them, sometimes it seemed like it was the other person's fault, sometimes it seemed like it was my fault. But the one thing I felt I was true was that I discovered I did not have control over the most important things in my life. I, was, I didn't have control over my anger, my jealousy, my lust. And at that point, and it was a difficult time, I started to wonder whether God exists again. And when the time, when it happened, uh, you know, God showed up. So I that, so for me, that was very difficult. It was, but I, I remember one night I was drunk, and um, I went up to a church, the University of Waterloo, and I did my math degree. And I, it was middle of the night. I just sat outside that church for most of that, in the eve, that night, and nobody answered the door. And I went home and I thought, God, I knew you weren't there. But later on, you know, when, 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 when time was right, I became a Christian. Okay, so that's one. Let me give you another example. I was at University of Michigan. I was an assistant professor. When I graduated out of Cornell, I, things went really well. I mean, I was very blessed. Um, that's what people say when things go well. I was very blessed. And, and so I ended up with like 12 offers for like every major business school in the country. Right. I decided to go to Michigan, and I used to, I, you know, I'd say I'm a Christian, so I'd say, well, you know, it's all to God, the glory, it's really God, it's not me, you know, sound humble. And, and then I went to Michigan, right? And the first year went well. I published a number of papers. The second year, I didn't have any publications. This went on for about 18 months. And I started to get depressed. And I thought, why am I depressed? If I'm, I was. And I remember one night I couldn't sleep. I was just struggling. It was almost dawn. I could see light coming in the window. And suddenly there was this picture in my mind of something I read when I was in high school. It was, uh, it was a book called The Lord of the Rings. You heard of it? Mm -hmm. So in that, in the story, right, there was this guy, this little hobbit, right, this little hairy creature, I had a Tasha the Hobbit, and he has a job, right, they gave, there was a ring, this ring has tremendous powers, whoever carries it has great power. The trouble is, the more you carry it, the more you want it, and you can't let it go. And so, you know, the, the more powerful a person originally is, the more, more addictive the ring is. So they gave it to this hobbit, this, this little thing that has no ambitions. He's a, he likes to drink his hot tea in front of his fireplace and eat poppy seed cakes. Right? Little guy. So he's supposed to carry the ring, and he's supposed to take it to the edge of the world and throw it in the fire. And the fellowship of the ring is a bunch of much more powerful people, wizards and everybody, who protects this little, little thing takes him to there, and he's just supposed to throw it in. Right? So in the movie, the, in, in, actually in the book, there was no movie at the time, in the book, Tolkien uh, wrote about this one poignant scene where the, hob, the, the, hob, the hobbit, Bilbo in this case, basically, his, 
he had the ring, and his, his friend, Gandalf, says, you're addicted to the ring. And, uh, and Gollum says, no, I'm not. And then he says, well, if you're not, take out the ring. Put it over on the mantle. Put it next to the fireplace. Just put it down right there. And then, so Bilbo takes the ring out. He looks at the ring. He just keeps looking at the ring. And then he says, I don't have to prove anything. And he puts it back in his pocket. <laughs> so that night, you know, that early in the morning, there was this point, it's just like, it was one of the few times it was so obvious to me that God was talking to me. I felt like I saw that picture in my mind. I had read that book many, many years ago when I was in junior high. And suddenly I felt like God saying, you are the ring bearer, and you won't let go. And I'll tell you three things that were on my mind that day. Okay. One was, I had a paper. The paper was under submission. It was the fourth round. And the creditor wanted me to put in a control variable. When I put the control variable in, the results were gone. That's one. There was another one where I had written some papers. There was a, a, a paper submitted. I'm a blind, blind referee, right? I'm a referee. And the, the paper criticized an earlier paper of ours. The trouble is, I kind of felt like they were right. And I'm supposed to write the referee report. And the third thing that was in my mind that night, I had submitted a paper into the journal. The review came back. The reviewer said, I know the author. He should not say this, right? This is blind, even if you, back in those days, we didn't have SSR. We had, didn't have all these web where you could search. And he says, I know this, the, the author. I think he's very ambitious. He's writing so many papers. This paper is unclear. He didn't even talk about the results. It's just that it's badly written. And then he said, you know, he just complained. The problem with me that night was I didn't know what to do with those things. But after, after that, that epiphany, it was very easy. I got up in the morning, I wrote back to the editor, I resubmitted the journal, I showed that the, when the control variable is in, the result is, is gone. I discussed why I think that's the case. And I just left it. The other one, I sent back to the review. I explain why I think this might be reasonable. I don't know why it was so hard. You know, life is not hard. There are no, there are no moral dilemmas in life if it's always win-win. That is, we sometimes we teach, we teach win-win. We say if you are, if you are honest, then people will trust you, and then you have loyalty, and you make a lot of money. It's not always win-win. And then the third one, I didn't even bother to submit that paper again. But I'll tell you what's really amazing. And it's irrelevant. I think the most important thing is actually what happened that night okay, and what I chose to do. I started to realize, so, so three, three months later, three, three and a half months later, I got a phone call. And I said, hello. And he said, this is Mark Rubenstein. I said, Rubenstein. Oh, he's a Berkeley professor. Oh, he's the president of the American Finance Association. He said, we'd like to publish your paper. I said, which paper? He said, oh, you know, I said, I said, which, which journal? It's the Journal of Finance. That's the top journal of finance. I said, I didn't submit it to the Journal of Finance. He said, yeah, but you presented it at the annual meeting. But there's 700 submissions to the annual meeting, right? He said, we, we published seven of them, and we'd like to publish yours. And I realized it was the paper, the paper that was supposed to be badly written. So I said, you know, it's really badly written. It's unclear. And he said, well, actually, we think it's very clear. In fact, you don't have to change anything. But if you want to, you know, we'll give you two weeks to change whatever you want. And then he tried to sell me on why. He said, I know you must have submitted to another journal, but the Journal of Finance really think this will be a great home for it. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm sitting there holding the phone saying, God, are you kidding me? I want to tell you something, OK? God doesn't care so much about what your resume looks like. He cares more about who you are and who you're going to become. It's not even what you do. It's who you are. And it, that, that really helped me. It really helped me realize that you've got to hold on lightly. Anything you cannot let go of has got you. That's what I created. I'll give you the third example. 
I have three close friends whom I go fly fishing with. We've done this for about 15 years. In the last two months, I lost two of them. They're both young. One of them is a professor at the University of Toronto. The other one is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I haven't even flown to his funeral yet. I'm going to do that next week. It's really hard. It's really hard. One died of a heart attack. The other one died of cancer. Two days before my second friend died, I begged his wife that I could go visit him. She said, you know, Rick doesn't want anyone to visit you because he doesn't want to be seen the way he is now. Plus, he'll get very emotional. Then I get an email back from her on Thursday. It says, Rick wants me to tell you something. Rick wants me to tell you you are his best friend. And next morning he died. I wrote back to Rick. I wrote back to Stephanie because I couldn't write back to Rick. I wrote back to Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, please tell him the same here. And then I said to her, I said, and please tell him everything is going to be all right. How do I know that? I'm just this pumpkin. I know that because I believe God is good and He is fair. And I believe that He loves Rick more than you and I know how to. And I don't know how things become all right. I just know when I pray that it is into His hands that I entrusted this. You ask me how I deal with difficulties in my life, honestly, Difficulties do not become fewer. But there is this, before I was a Christian, in my most quiet, most lucid moments, I am melancholy. I see clearly life as what it seems to be, finite, limited. After I became a Christian, I still have my ups and downs. But in my most lucid moments, when I am most clear, my peace, my heart is at peace, and I have joy. And I see people around me, not as people that I compete with, but objects of love, God's love, and right in mind. was a long question. Now, now I'll answer. Now you won't dare to ask me another one. It is 531. Am I allowed to keep going? Is there any more questions? So, uh, the last one. Okay. so thank you very much for your nice presentation. I think it's loud enough. So I have one. I think it's a little difficult because there is one great right in China. He said that the reason, the most natural reason people believe in religious is, is kind of selfish. They want to bless themselves when they are alive or bless them, uh, when they are dead in hell. The name of the life is Hu Shi. So um, in terms of you, so the reason you believe in religious is only to sacrifice or dedicate or you will also want to get some or benefit for yourself? Mm, great my... question. You know, this is the economists say this is a, a question of the what we call the utility function. You know, what makes you want to do what you want to do? Maybe because uh, are you getting something out of it, or do you just want to do something? So I would the way I would put this is, if I am a creature, what's your big job? Your big job. If I am a creature, right? The best thing for me to do is to do God's will. A light bulb, the best place to be is to be in the light socket. Is it good for the light bulb to be in the light socket, or is it bad for the light bulb to be in the socket? It's just where it belongs. 
if you have never been in a light socket, you will say, wait a minute, is this light bulb wanting to be in the light socket because it wants to shine? Or is this light bulb wanting a light socket because it wants to bring light to the world? Light bulb doesn't know. Light bulb just knows when it's in the socket, it belongs. I don't know about answering the question. I think, of course, the creature that finds the creator is blessed. Of course. But that creature also becomes a blessing. And it's not because you want to be a blessing or you want to be blessed. It's just because you are the creature looking for home. No one can make themselves believe. A lot of people say, gee, it would be great, I like the side benefits. If I could just make myself believe, like swing and then it would be great. If you could do that, that would be great. But then that would be like self-help, right? I don't think what happened to me was self-help. But I would say, I have talked to a lot of people, a lot of non-Christians. I had a conversation with the, with the ch chancellor at University of Washington when I had a conversation with her a few months ago on a forum that's university-wide. And she said, I think your faith is a gift. Not everyone got the gift. And I said, I agree it's a gift, because I didn't earn it. But the best things in life are gifts. No, my wife loves me. I didn't turn it. The grace, the kindness of a particular teacher. He didn't. And what I get from God, I didn't earn. But I believe it really happened. I believe he continues to love. And I believe one day he'll straighten out a lot of things that are pretty messed up. I would, I would say, yeah. If, if in your worldview there is no God, then you will always look to make things happen in a sensible way without God. If you have precluded God axiomatically, then you will always say, well, he's doing this because of that. He's doing this because of that. That's because in your worldview there is no other thing. I'm not saying you, I'm just talking to him, right? So, so let me, let me, if you, you guys are so kind, you could, you, you should really be, feel free to leave, but let me just say one thing, okay? So, there was a mathematician by the name of John Lennox, whom I really like a lot, he's an Oxford professor. And the way he frames it really helps me. He says, you know, there are really, there are two worldviews in the academy, two main worldviews. The first one is that matter and energy is primary. Matter and energy is what this world is all about. That's all there is. And everything else, your emotions, your feelings, are a derivative of that. Okay? So if I see somebody do strange things, it's because of something that I haven't understood yet in the world of matter and energy. Now, this is now the default view. Every other view in the academy is supposed to earn their way to the table. We call this the scientific view. But there is another view. It's called the Theistic view. Okay. So the first one is an atheistic view. The other one is a theistic view. The theistic view says the mind is the primary. Matter and energy are derivatives of the mind. In other words, the mind of God, in the beginning, God, okay, Logos. And all of energy and matter and, ener and, and, and everything derives from that. Now, one thing about science is sci these are axiomatic views. Science, which studies the how-tos within the world of matter and energy, cannot distinguish between those two views. But if your presupposition is, so, I mean, I may be wrong, so tell me if I'm wrong, right? But if your presupposition is there cannot be God, 
then whatever you see, you will fit into something. I'm not sure we're scientific about this. Yeah. So why is it that a scientist can be a Christian? Because frankly, God created everything. God created the, the natural order of things. He created me. And there are many things in my life that beyond matter and energy that, that matters, that make, give life meaning. For example, beauty, justice, love, friendship. They're not things that you study in this matter-energy world, but they give life purpose and meaning. Because we are more than the sum of our atomic parts. Many of the scriptures, not just the Christian, talk about the human being being a soul, something beyond the sum. And you have a soul. And this is the problem. We never feed our soul. We feed everything else except our soul. And the universities think that's science. And that's a problem. Science is about how. How the world of matter and energy works. Faith is about why. Why you are here. So the two are very, they're, they're addressing different questions. And one doesn't preclude the other. In fact, they're virtually orthogonal. You've been very patient, and we're already nine minutes after, but you let me start late, so you only get half of it back. So, uh, I'm happy to hang around, but I think we, I should probably give those of you who need to go a chance to go, and so maybe we should end, and then... Uh... Okay, how do you end the session? And uh, maybe you can have a round of applause for some more questions? Absolutely, I'll be right. Okay, can we just give a round of applause to Professor Lee?